Ooh. And there we go. Morning. Right then. Hello. My name's Martin Woodward. Uh, Martin Woo at Microsoft.com if you want to send me an email. At Martin Woodward if you want to send me some abuse on Twitter. More than welcome. I'm just going to mute my phone actually because I, I just got a bing bing just then. So yeah. Um, and I've got at work my, in my day job, I've got like the fancy title of Principal Group Program Manager DevOps, classic Microsoft, awesome at naming things. So Principal Group Program Manager, that basically means I delete a lot of email. And the DevOps part means I delete a lot of email using bash scripts. So uh, Today we're going to talk a bit about my journey um, with open source at Microsoft. I've been very lucky when I joined the company. But before I do that, let me take you back to the year of my birth. Uh, 1976, which I realize is ancient history for a lot of you here, but it was the year I was born, so a year I hold very dearly. Um, back then, that was, the, that was when Microsoft was founded in 1976. Um, 1976, though, you know, when you're talking color and monitors, really what you're doing is choosing between green and amber, you know, that, that, so it was back then. And then graphics like this, fancy displays and all these recordings and things just didn't happen. You know, it was all character-based terminals was, was the best you could hope for. Um, when we were there, and so when Microsoft were getting founded, uh, it was founded by a guy called Bill Gates. You know, you heard of him. He's a fairly rich guy. And this is sort of how people know him now, billionaire philanthropist. Back in 1976, he wasn't a billionaire philanthropist. He wasn't even a millionaire, you know, young guy seductively lying on his desk throwing floppy disks. Um, he was a bit of a juvenile delinquent. This was in uh, when he got a, a parking ticket, not a parking ticket, a traffic ticket for going for a red light in Albuquerque, the tech mecca that is Albuquerque. And the reason why he was there was because he was trying to start a business writing software for the Altair, um, he was writing the basic interpreter um, and trying to, trying to sell software. So not trying to sell hardware, but actually sell software. At that time, software wasn't really sold. Software was just shared. It was the beginnings of the open source movement. You know, in the computing labs in MIT and different places, people were just always sharing things. And people weren't really trying to sell the, the actual bits of software themselves. So, Bill didn't have a, a let's, let's just say he didn't have the smoothest of starts when it came to sharing of software because he was trying to do a business selling it. And so he's quite famous for doing his, you know, the letter to the people who, the, the sort of hobbyists um, saying, hey, you all steal my software, you know, and he even put his postal, like uh, his P.O. box so people could send a check in if they wanted to, to pay him for the software they'd stolen because um, they, weren't, they weren't respecting his license back at the time. Since then, we kind of had, you know, different uh, interactions with Microsoft CEOs and their relationships to uh, open source. Uh, you know, some classic quotes, which I'm not going to dig into. Uh, uh, but let's say uh, times have kind of changed recently, okay? And uh, it's pretty noticeable change. To be fair to Barma, I, a lot of the open source stuff I started was in 2009, 2010, when Steve Barma was still around. Uh, but Satch has really uh, got on board. Um, so yeah, so it, it's been a big change. And it's been a journey the company's had to go through and learn how to be mm, fairly hostile, if not frightened of open source, to being very supportive of open source today and actually you know, one of the major contributors to the Linux kernel, one of the, it's the, you know, the largest organization on GitHub now. And that's a huge journey to go through and one I've been very lucky and proud to be a part of. I myself uh, helped do a little bit of stuff around open source. I had two kind of, three major parts in Microsoft. So there was Eclipse. I was involved in our, our starting to use Eclipse a lot more. Um, then Git, so the version control system, Git. Again, back in 1976, we had different version control systems to Git. That's how old I am. You know, I remember there being more than one version control system. Uh, and then I also helped open source .NET as part of what I did uh, during my job. So I uh, helped set the .NET Foundation up. The .NET Foundation is like the center of the .NET ecosystem. So the .NET ecosystem is now a very open source ecosystem. Lots of projects around it, obviously cross-platform, 
um, high performance and uh, lots of, m most importantly, not just Microsoft behind .NET anymore, uh, but lots of companies, including a cheeky little startup called Google, you know, um, but Red Hat and people like that. So that's, that's the day job. The journey that .NET's been through has been fascinating. I, I'd say I was just a small part of this journey. I got involved in April 2014 uh, doing, um, helping open source the Roslyn compiler, which is the central compiler at the back of uh, .NET, and then through to creating the .NET Foundation, and then um, the Mono project and Xamarin joining Microsoft, and then Mono becoming part of the .NET Foundation, and actually um, Nat Friedman, who's the, who was the CEO of Xamarin, and uh, Miguel Diaz is like boss kind of thing. He's now my boss, so there you go. Um, right. Now, when we open source stuff like .NET or you know other things, people always ask me, you know, oh hey, does this mean X is getting open source like Windows or Media Center or I don't know Notepad or whatever or, or Cliff, uh, this is Microsoft Bob again for the youngsters in the room. This is a, a thing. This is the precursor to Clippy, so there you go. Uh, so, if you, you know, are you going to open source X, Y, Z? So I thought it'd be useful to kind of, first of all, explain why we open source stuff and then kind of explain the journey. So when Microsoft, because Microsoft is still a business, they're still trying to make money, and it's important to remember that, but they've changed their business model deliberately to be a lot more open source friendly. So they use open source in a couple of different ways. One is when we're just trying to be use, use open source collaboration as a way of being completely agile, as a way of collaborating with others and building on things. So .NET is a fantastic example of this, but TypeScript and Chakra, our JavaScript engine, are other examples. So let's take .NET. It's incredibly hard to get companies to upgrade .NET versions because, you know, it works. I'm not going to touch it. it. Just leave me alone, you know, leave it. Whereas by working in the open source community with .NET, we're able to get people to look at the very, very latest check-in, like literally the very latest pull request, the very latest uh, check-in and commit into master. People are looking at that code, working with that code, we're in the latest CI builds, and we're able to have a discussion that's really driving the future of .NET forwards a lot quicker than in the old days when it was ship it for, you know, wait two years, try and get somebody to upgrade, then get some feedback, then go into another two-year cycle, ship it, you know. So it allows us to iterate a lot more quickly. And regardless of how well you deliver or not in software, it's incredibly hard to predict where you're going to be in two years or even in six weeks. So a lot of times in the software industry, the people that can iterate the fastest are the people that are going to succeed eventually because they're going to try, try, try until they succeed. And then, okay, I've learned a lesson. Let's move on. And as long as you keep incrementally learning lessons, then you will succeed. So we need to iterate quickly. The other example is like, uh, again, this is a classic bit of Microsoft speak, enable monetization for a broad user base. What does that mean? Make money, you know. Uh, so this is Microsoft's evil part, okay. We're just going to give away this stuff for free under an open source license. Microsoft's preferred license is actually MIT because MIT is more compatible with lots. It used to be Apache 2 because lawyers like patent language, which is in Apache 2. But it's MIT now because there's, it's short license, easy to read, and it's compatible with GPL and things like that. So we can go everywhere and, and it can also go into commercial software. So there's things like Visual Studio Code, like, you know, it's just the, uh, uh, does anybody use Visual Studio Code here? I'm interested. Awesome. Cool. So that's the, their open source development environment, their open source editor cross-platform. Or even like SDKs for Azure, our cloud services. Like, why weren't they always open source? They don't make money on those, you know? They, they, they only make money by you talking to a back-end service, i.e. Azure, i.e. the cloud, which is another reason why we do a lot of contributions to Linux now. We're trying to run Linux in our cloud, and Microsoft make money selling Linux to everybody. So the faster Linux can run, the more money, well, I just shouldn't say the more money Microsoft can make. The, the cost savings that we can pass on to customers, there you go, that's the official, uh, yeah. Um, but the, the cheaper we can run Linux in our, in our data centers, then, you know, the, the more efficiently we can run our data centers. So that then pays for investment. If we have 
make a 0.5% improvement to the performance of Azure, we're hosting like, you know, a lot of Azure. <laughs> so it, it pays for the developer time, and that's why we can pay for our contributions to open source. And speaking of which, the compatibility side is the final one. So Linux is a great example of that. Uh, Git is an example that I've worked most closely on. So we use Git as, we use Git for the Windows source code base. The Windows is in Git in the, the system I work on called Visual Studio Team Services. Just think about that for a sec. Git was written by Linus Torvalds to help manage the Linux kernel. And now the Windows team have 4,000 engineers checking in. Like there was 10 million commits in the recent full creators update over like 50,000 pull requests. This is, Windows is using Git. That's just insane. I don't know what, I haven't spoken to Linus about it. I have no idea what he thinks about it, but it's pretty awesome, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, and then things like Docker and stuff. So they're where we're heavily invested in an open source ecosystem. To have any influence in an open source community, the only way you can have any influence at all, but it's going to stay working in the direction you need it to do, is by contributing. Contributing code, contributing effort. Talk is cheap. It's all right to, ra you know, please raise issues. Please raise, you know, b bugs with us. Uh, with an open source project, that's great, and we appreciate them. But giving somebody code to an open source project is that you have a lot more influence when you start contributing code, and when you're a committer, and when you become a maintainer of these open source projects. Uh, that's how you help influence the project and make sure somebody else doesn't influence it, and suddenly it doesn't run on Azure. That would be a that would be a um, you know that would be a very bad business day for Microsoft. So we need to invest in Linux to make sure that doesn't happen. But that just means it improves Linux and improves Git and improves these sorts of things. Okay, let's talk about our open source journey. So uh, the first thing you need to do in a company, like when you're trying to do open source in a business, we tried this for a while and kind of failed, and, and just it kind of been a hobby. So and then it became successful when we sort of were took it in business terms to our company. So how did we do that? The first one was figure out what the business need was. Why are we doing open source? And it's no good for it just to be a hobby. It has to be a sustainable thing that the business is making money on, otherwise the business won't invest in it, if you're a, if you're a company, okay? Um, so figure out what your business need is. Back in 2012, probably, yeah, 2012, I was working on a product called Team Foundation Server, and uh, which is the precursor to Visual Studio Team Services, which is the cloud-hosted thing I do now. And it was, you know, winning. It was leading the Gartner Quadrant. We were competing with people like IBM and all these sorts of people. And it was great. Uh, top of the world kind of thing. And we had the version control component within Team Foundation Server, a centralized version control system called TFVC, which had kind of two modes of operation. A check-in, check-out model. I'm not going to dig into source control theory. I could talk about this for, like, literally a day. Uh, think of that as like a per 4 c cvs -E type model, and then a, um, an, a subversion type model, you know? So we had those two types of modes of source control. Again, in the old days, we used to have lots of different source control systems, kids. It was amazing. Right, and then I was on a, on a plane one day. Um, read it, I do a lot of flying. I work, uh, I, I live up the road in Randallstown. Um, but I work from my house, uh, and my main office is in Redmond, in, near Seattle, and then we ha I have to go to a few offices around to see all the different teams. And uh, I fly a lot, which is great. I have good air miles, and, you know, I've got nice hotel points, which is awesome. Um, but I fly a lot, and you can only watch, you know, Batman so many times on the plane before you've, you know, Bat especially Batman versus Superman, that was terrible. So... Uh, you get very bored, so I read a lot on planes. And uh, the book, I was actually sat down and read The Innovator's Dilemma. If you haven't, everyone's kind of heard of this book, and they think they know what it means by the title, and it kind of gets quoted. But actually sit down and read it, because it really helps you understand how to identify disruptive technologies to your business, and then how to react to disruptive technologies in your business. So I was reading The Innovator's Dilemma, on actually going through reading it, and I was like, huh. We'd been, I'd been reading a bit about these things called distributed version control systems. And it was interesting because they didn't do anything 
that our customers were asking for. Our customers were asking for different security models, blah, 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 and all this sort of stuff. And then there was this thing called Mercurial and Git coming along that didn't do any of those things, worked completely differently. And yet, they had a completely different cost model. They were hugely more, they were hugely cheaper to host in the cloud because all the work's distributed, it runs on the client. And they were incredibly popular. You know, we've seen, I've seen like a, a hockey stick graph and adoption. It was still way, way, way below what we were getting used. You know, we were being used by about a third of professional developers and Git was that way, at the time, less than 6%. Um, but it was, the growth was really shooting up. So, I was like, that's interesting. So let's think about distributed version control. You know, what can we do around distributed version control? Now in Microsoft, obviously the inclination was, hey, not invented here, let's go build our own. That was the first thing, so no, don't build our own. And then the next one was, well, let's use Git or Mercurial. And if you were a, a betting person at that time, you'd probably go for Mercurial for Microsoft because the common law, the common logic was Mercurial is more user-friendly, and it is. Git's not user-friendly at all, but we all know that. And it works better on Windows was the common thing. So surely then we should use Mercurial. However, Mercurial's growth was like this, and Git's growth was like that. And so I thought to myself, heck, I work at Microsoft, you know? Like, Git doesn't work well on Windows. What if we get the Windows team to use Git? Then Git's going to work really well on Windows. And so that's kind of the plan. That's kind of what we did. And we added Git into Team Foundation Server and Git into Visual Studio Team Services. So that was our business need. Importantly, is you know your business. Don't fake a business need, okay? These are all reasons that, in a second, that Microsoft have tried in the past to adopt open source, and I hear from customers I talk to, and they're not reasons to do open source sustainably. They're like side benefits. So, for example, PR. Like, people say, oh, let's open source something. It'll get us on Hacker News. Yes, it gets you on Hacker News. That's for, like, two hours, you know, a day. You see a little short-term spike in traffic, and if you don't keep investing in that open source project, quickly people are going to hate you because you've thrown something over the wall and not, not invested in it. So don't do it for PR, but you do get PR when you do it, which is good. Goodwill, you know, you've got this goodwill. Uh, people are going to like you better, karma, whatever. Uh, awesome and true, people do like you better. It's a lot, you know... Uh, I get a lot nicer reaction when I go to OzCon and places like that now working for Microsoft than I did just when I started at Microsoft and people would walk out from our sponsored dinners, which was always exciting. But, uh, you know, yes, you get goodwill. Yes, karma does come back to you. But you can't take karma to the bank. Karma's not sustainable, unfortunately. I can't feed developers on karma. Um, so goodwill isn't a business goal. And neither is recruitment. Yes, it's true that it's a lot easier to hire developers now at Microsoft because people see the stuff we're doing and they really want to come work with us, especially in the Seattle area, you know, Cloud City, we call it, where, um, you know, it's a very competitive job market. The fact that we're a lot more open to open source has helped us enormously with the talent we're able to recruit. But it's no good if these people can't keep on working on open source because then the talent you've recruited will just go invisible. So, again, you do get it, but it's not the business reason. It's, a bit, it's just an, a, a side benefit. Right, so you know what your business need is. Next is to understand what's your commercial advantage as a business. So let's take the Git case. We were trying to figure out how we wanted to host Git uh, for our version control system. How are we going to host it? Now, people like GitHub um, use uh, Git, core Git. So, you know, git.exe on Windows or whatever, the core Git, and they host it on their back-end servers in Linux. And they actually have some fancy disk mounting stuff to make that happen. But they're fundamentally using the same Git they use client-side to host Git on the back-end server, or they were anyway. That wasn't going to work for us, because we wanted to host ours on Azure, Microsoft Azure, Microsoft's cloud, the cloud. And, um, it's, you know, we wanted it to be what you call a PaaS, so, you know, platform as a service model. We didn't want to be mounting lots of VMs with 
uh, hard drives mounted into them. That's how we originally did Git hosting on a, I used to look after a thing called Coplex, Microsoft's original open source hosting thing. Again, came before GitHub, but you know, this is what we had before GitHub kids. Uh, so that's how Git hosting on Coplex worked. You used to mount drives and things, and that's not a scalable way of hosting things at you know, cloud scale, doing it at full pass. So we needed to be able to host Git in a process, and we looked at a library called libgit2. Libgit2 is awesome. If you want to do any programmatic access to a Git repository, go look at the libgit2 library. It's written in C99. You know, it's like old school. Uh, it's got hardly, it's got basically zero dependencies. Uh, you can pull it in, and then there are lots of language bindings for different languages. So there was a, an awesome C# -sharp binding for .NET, but there's you know there's Python bindings, there's um, Objective C bindings, and all this sort of stuff. So uh, and Node and Ruby and all sorts. So libgit2 was the library we wanted. However, libgit2 was okay. Didn't do merge. So it, it couldn't merge a branch. Now merging is essential in a Git server because you want to be able to build a pull request system. You want to be able to press the merge button on the server and merge pull requests in. Turns out that's the only way to actually do Git at scale when you're working in very, very large teams where you have like 4,000 developers like we do on Windows checking into the same Git repository. If you require people to merge on their client machine and then push, after about 200 developers working on, on the same day, you quickly run into a model where nobody can push because they get into push races, you know, where somebody pushes, found somebody else has already pushed that commit, so then they have to pull it back, merge, go to push again, and somebody's already pushed, and so you get into a race condition. So you do pull requests on the server. So we needed merge logic. So we needed to add merge logic to libgit2. Now, libgit2 is being used by you know, GitHub a little bit at this time. Uh, they now use it extensively, and by Google and by other people. The old Microsoft, or, the old, you know, or lots of older managers at Microsoft, should we say, might be like, well, hang on a minute, you're going to build merge logic into libgit2. That's thousands and thousands of dollars of IP that you're going to give away for free that's a commercial advantage and enable you to merge quicker on the server. Turns out people don't pick their version control hosting providers by how quick a merge can happen. Okay? When was the last time, you, oh, where shall I host my Git repository? I know, a merge completes in uh, 120 milliseconds rather than 480 milliseconds. That's just not how you judge your server. You judge it on how well you can host it, how good the capabilities are. So our commercial advantage wasn't in that merge logic, wasn't in being able to do it quick. It was being able to host it at scale and support groups like Windows. And so our commercial, uh, yeah, so as I say, our commercial advantage is being able to host big repositories and being able to do enterprise Git. If we look at Git itself, it's a 34 meg repository. It's fairly manageable. Uh, Roslyn, Microsoft's open source, you know, uh, uh, compiler for .NET, it's 230 meg, again, fairly manageable as a Git repository. That's the first one I was really involved with. And then Linux, which is the, the big daddy of, uh, of, you know, Git repositories, or it used to be. Um, the one that Git was written for and the one that Git was all its scale was designed around was a whopping 650 meg, you know, which is fairly big. That, you know, it would take two Linuxes to fill up a floppy disk, you know, it's a nightmare. However, the Visual Studio Team Services code base I work on in Git is 3 gig. The Windows code base is 300 gig. And that's not with history, okay, that is master. So trying to solve those problems is what we do, you know, trying to do this at scale. And that is our commercial advantage. We actually partners with GitHub. We work on libgit2 together. The code one of my colleagues wrote, a guy called uh, Ed Thompson, he wrote the code which merges everybody's pull requests while at Microsoft. He wrote it for us. We shipped it in libgit2. Now GitHub use it, and Atlassian use it, and uh, GitLab use it. Everybody uses this same code to merge pull requests. And it's great, because we know that the code we have in our system to merge pull requests works really well, <laughs> you know, because everybody's using it and tested it and raised bugs and found out times where it doesn't work. And so it's awesome, and we get help fixing things on it. So 
the key there is open source, again, this is from a film from this era as well, War Games. Turns out open source isn't a zero-sum game. Just because you're giving away how to do something to a competitor doesn't mean that you, you lose, okay? Everybody wins. And that's one of the key parts of open source is you're all working collaboratively together to m build value for everybody, not just, you know, if I have value, you can't have it. You're sharing it and building on top. But you've got to find a business model that allows you to do that. Right then, I've got to... So that's that, step two, understand your advantage. Next, you've got to go and convince the bosses. Next, you've got to go and convince your stakeholders. So convincing your, your co-workers, how do you do that? Well, I'm a, a, a nerd, you know, like looking up from my feet at you guys is, is, is actually taking effort from me right now, you know what I mean? Like convincing people isn't something I do easily. Uh, so the first thing we did was actually uh, go enlist the help of our sales team. Okay. Now, as engineers, we don't like this as an answer normally. I talk to the sales guys, are you kidding me? Turns out the sales team uh, are very, very good at convincing people. And once we talk to them, hey, we want to add Git, hey, we want to start selling Linux, hey, we want to you know, do all these sorts of things, the sales guys and girls go and talk to their customers and go, oh, right, yeah, people really want this and will pay us money for it. Okay, I'm going to help you convince management that this is a good idea. So enlist the help of your sales team. Then you've got to go talk to your management. That was a whole different set of discussions and, you know, how to explain things to them. Go talk to the lawyers. Can we do this? Turns out I was very, very lucky. This is my legal team. So they were on board straight away, which made it really easy for me. Uh, and then you have to go and convince, you know, the boss. And again, I was incredibly lucky at when I landed in Microsoft. My boss was a guy called, uh, called Scott Guthrie, who's very open source friendly, and then obviously Satcher. So... Easy peasy for me, so not everybody has it as easy as I do. So there you go. Sorry about that. That's why they call it work. Um, and then finally, you've got to go explain things to your customers. For a company like Microsoft, that was actually quite hard. Uh, well, not hard. We just have to say, hey, look, we're still going to give you this software under the same license that we were giving to it to you before. We're still going to support you. We're still going to give you commercial terms so you can, you know, hold us over the fire if it goes wrong. But we're consuming open source as part of that, and that's fine, and this is good. Then you've got to make sure you keep it legal, and this is a quick plug. The, if we want people to respect our license, if Microsoft want people to not steal their software, then they have to respect the licenses of people in the open source community. You know, it's only, it, it just has to happen. And... Um, Different licenses have different exceptions, and you need to put structure in place in your company to make sure you're following those responsibilities, but you must follow them and make sure you do. So that involves talking to the legal team, and, but also educating yourself on licenses and things. And again, we can talk about licenses all day if you want to later on outside. We in Microsoft, because we're a big company, we have lots of people, we actually automate a lot of our compliance scanning, make sure we're not accidentally shipping something in a product that doesn't allow us to redistribute that source code in that way. So we have some scanning tools. White Source is a cool plugin that allows you to do that. Uh, but we do that. But the important thing is not to be afraid of it, not to just say no, you know, just, to, just contribute. Because who here is a maintainer of an open source library? That's a good question. Who maintains the library? Okay, a few of us. Of those maintainers, keep your hands up. Who really likes people using their software? Okay, everybody's still got their hands up. Open, that's the reason people contribute to open source. It's because they want people to use their software. And they want people to con con contribute. So if you go and reach out to the different open source people and say, hey, I'm wanting to do this with this, wanted to let you know, want to make sure that you're okay with that, people are incredibly friendly, especially if you come with gifts of code. By the way, I found a bug and here's the fix. You know, people are very, very welcoming. Quick plug for the Software Freedom Conservancy. They're the foundation behind the Git project, which I'm a part of. I'm wearing their shirt today. I'm a supporter. Uh, the Software Freedom Conservancy does a lot of work behind the scenes, making sure people do respect people's licenses, and that's an essential part, you know, uh, make sure people don't steal software, regardless of if they're a company or, or a hobbyist. Nobody should steal software. Okay. Then be part of a community. Don't fork the code. This is the thing I had to explain to Microsoft. You need to contribute the changes back to the open source project because if you don't, you fork the code base and then you're going to go off down here 
and you're going to build your own fixes. And even if you're not legally, even if you don't have to send the code upstream because of the license, you still should. Because if you don't, you get further and further from the open source upstream version, and then you can no longer pull their changes over easily. And so you no longer get free features. This is how you explain it to managers. What was the point of using open source if you're not going to be able to keep in sync with the, the, the latest fixes, the latest security fixes? So make sure you don't fork. Make sure you encourage people to contribute. And why are you encouraging people to contribute? And then finally, as part of that community, make sure you make it fun for your community. So I spend a lot of time you know, coming up with crazy gifts and things to get out to people to thank them for contributing to .NET. And then, like we did a mug, a cup of tea mug, hilarious, you know. Uh, it was, I mainly try and insert English jokes into an American company because I just find it amusing. Uh, but this was the cup of tea joke we did. And we gave these to lots of contributors. We laser etched their commit IDs into the, into the mug and then sent it to them. And then in little, we'd have, we do these little videos for conferences where our execs are on stage and things. And it's like a, you know, a warm-up video. And so we kind of sneak in as little Easter eggs, you know, these sorts of things. So that people who have one are like, oh, yeah, that's the mug I've got. You know, and just make it fun. Make it responsive. Make the whole community that you're in be part of it. Finally, well not finally, step six of the step seven journey. Step six was have a bit of success. Nothing helps by winning, you know. This is like A-B testing inside of a process. H have a bit of success, learn from it, and then do it again. So Git, turns out these are the latest Stack Overflow results. Git is now used by nearly 90% of developers. TFEC, which was dominant, is now at 10.9%. If we hadn't done that fix, we'd have been in a, a really sticky situation. IBM aren't really in this business anymore, but we are because we, would, because we did this, you know? And then, yeah, hey, by the way, this is the version control systems that people use, okay? Zip files and file shares are not version control people, just, okay? Let's move on from that. But, again, I'll talk about that in the break. And then, get, you know, getting PR always helps as well. People are really happy. I did a blog post this week about the Windows thing, and people loved it, you know, hacking news, blah, blah, blah. Um, .NET's really successful. Lots, more importantly, I, li I love the fact that the majority of the contributions to .NET now come from outside of Microsoft. That's a huge change to the business. And seeing the level of contributions come in and expand over the years has just been really, really, really delightful for me as part of somebody who was involved in that. So yeah, more success, high velocity. Do Visual Studio Code is doing amazingly well, by the way. If you haven't tried it, go take a look at it. But it's hugely a uh, popular open source project. And then you get all these great delightful things that happen. People send you pull requests you don't understand that improve the performance of something you wrote. Okay? People build stuff you've never even thought of. This is a PHP compiler for .NET. Who knew that was even possible? Somebody went and built that because we'd open sourced it. Uh, the IntelliJ people built Rider. Amazing. It's a great IDE. Uh, somebody built an IDE for the iPad for C Sharp that has proper edit and continue. That doesn't even work in Visual Studio, and it works on the iPad. How is this possible? Okay, but it does. So have a bit of success. And then the last step is bring this culture change back into your company. This was Microsoft when I joined. This was the org chart, a cartoon of Microsoft when I joined. Very, very recognizable to me, all right? Uh, we needed to change that. We needed to break down the silos inside of Microsoft. And so what we do now is when you create a project inside of Microsoft, inside of VSTS, you, all the projects by default are publicly visible to every other engineer inside Microsoft. You can do pull requests. I can do pull requests against Windows if I wanted to. I can finally fix you know, Unix line ending support in Notepad if I wanted to. I've tried. Believe me, it's not easy. No, I've tried. Okay. <laughs> Turns out, anyway, I'll, I'll tell you about that pull request later on. It didn't get, it didn't get accepted. Uh, but, um, you know, we can do, we can try, uh, we can send pull requests around, we can contribute, all that sort of thing. Um, and change the culture inside your company. This is Anders. He's uh, he invented Delphi and, you know, a, a lot of C Sharp and stuff. Very, very, very smart guy. That's his GitHub commit graph. This smart, like, actual verifiable genius is on GitHub checking in code every single day. That's awesome to see. I knew we'd really won. I knew we'd changed the company. Microsoft's a very email culture still. You know, we do have like Teams channels and Slack and everything else. But we're very email centric at the minute, which is, you know, the same. Whenever somebody has a baby, you send out the obligatory, I've had a baby photo, you know, that says, hey, look, we had a baby. 
the first reply that came back to it was plus one looks good to merge. I was like, yes, <laughs> open source is winning. And then finally for the people, the younger people here who get involved in open source, open source turns out to be a great way to build your career, to show what you're capable of. Uh, we have um, a, a chat ops bot called .NET bot that does a lot of stuff for us. We can tell it in the Teams channel, we can ask it to go make a global change and it'll do it. So it'll do automation tool for us. But as a result, it has a commit graph that's better than Anders Halsberg's commit graph, okay? .NET bot looks the boss. It's clearly a bot, but it looks the boss. .NET bot regularly gets emails from recruiters asking him if they want to come work on the... <laughs> But if you think about this, this email was probably sent by a robot to another robot. <laughs> We're all doomed. Okay. Right then, so there your success for success of open, adopting open source in your side of your company. Um, as I say, I've been involved in this. I've been very proud to be part of this movement inside of Microsoft to do open source, but I'm, I'm just a small, small cog in the wheel. So that's me, little me, and there are now thousands of people inside Microsoft contributing to Git every single day and contributing to open source every day. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And thank you for helping me change Microsoft one pull request at a time. So thank you.